Hello and good evening. It's good to be back. And we have another session tonight, as you can see, and another guest. Uh, and of course, this guest has been here with us before. So, Dr. Alejandra, thank you so much already for uh, joining us once again. And uh, I, it's always a pleasure to, to host the webinar with you. And so, how are you feeling tonight? Thank you, Caroline. I'm excited to perform the webinar tonight. That's great to hear, and of course, we are definitely excited to have you back. And uh, for some of you that might not know uh, Dr. Alejandra yet, uh, let me introduce her. So Dr. Alejandra Aguilar Crespo, she is the gynecologist and consultant specialist at Equipo Juana Crespo, uh, which is located in Valencia. So um, welcome back. And of course, today she will be talking about uterine factors and IVF options, diagnostics and treatment options. This time uh, we have an online patient meeting, which means we will simply start with some of the most common questions. So Dr. Alejandra will first answer those questions. But after that, right after that, it will be time for your questions, of course, you can type those in the chat section so that she can help you out. And uh, well, just let me first explain and uh, sorry, tell you a little bit on our Stronger Together events. As you know, we are here every single day from Monday till Friday to support you, to ask and to answer your questions. And of course, to will give you opportunity to meet the top fertility experts as we have today. And of course, uh, all those events are brought to you thanks to our ambassadors and partners and all of them you can see on the as well right here so that will be uh, it from me at this point but of course uh, so we will start with those most common questions okay so Dr. Alejandra are you ready to begin with those questions yes I'm wonderful and, Perfect. And of course, uh, remember that you can type the questions, your questions, uh, even right now. And uh, the, uh, Dr. Alejandro will simply answer them for you once we finish with those five most common questions. And the very first question that we have is, should the septic uterus always be removed? Okay. So, uh, on the one hand, okay, uh, the septic uterus, I want to tell you that this is the most uterine uh, mullerian abnormality, is the most frequent one, okay, so uh, should the septic uterus always be removed? Is the, re the answer is no, okay, it depends, also it depends on the, on the degree of the, of the septum, okay, if it's a complete septum, uh, if the, the removal of this septum can, it will be, uh, it, 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 it's, it improves the results, okay? So yes, this, it, it should be removed. But it's, it has only been removed if there is a context of uh, infertility or recurrent miscarriage or, uh, or obstetric complication in a previous, in a previous pregnancy, for example. But it's, it's, it has not all, uh, always been removed. Sometimes when we are performing a cesarean section, we can see that this woman has a septum and, and it, 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 we, have, we have not seen it. So, so it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that having a septum uh, can, can be correlated with infertility. But uh, are more or less 25% of women uh, who has a septum can be infertile. Okay, so, so it depends. It depends on the cost, it depends on the history of the patient. Okay, but here in our clinic, of course, if we are facing a couple with a history of infertility, and we diagnose a, a septum, it can it, it, it has to be removed. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the very first question. And let's go to the next one that we have right here. So should intramural fibers be operated? Okay. So as as the you said uterus, okay. It depends. It depends. Uh, it depends on the location and on the size of the fibers. Okay, if the fibro uh, doesn't reach the endometrial cavity, okay, and it's not very big. I mean, it's less than uh, three centimeters. We can. We we can. It has not been. It has not been removed. Okay, but it depends. It depends because the uterine the uterine fibro, depending on the location, it can alter the, the structure. 
and can also alter the, the uterine architecture. So sometimes it's worth to, to, to remove it. Okay? But we have also to take into account the, the previous history of the patient. If this patient has previous cycle, previous uh, cycles and previous uh, the failed transfers and failed cycles, sometimes we can remove the, the, the fiber. Okay? If there is an intramural fiber that, that reaches the endometrial cavity, of course, we have to remove because the implantation can decrease, okay? Or even if it's, an, um, if it's a fiber that is very, very big, uh, it doesn't, it, it, this part doesn't reach the endometrial cavity, but it's very, very big. Sometimes the uterine architecture can be damaged and the implantation can be affected. So sometimes we, we have to remove it. Here, you know, we have, we have uh, our, sometimes we have patients that, uh, they, we have, they only have a fiber, and after removing the fiber, then she, she got pregnant. So sometimes it is worth, but it depends on the size of the location and of the previous history of the patient. Yeah. And again, thank you so much for answering the question as well. And next question that we do have is campaign for periods. Did we, Maria, affect the uterine function? Yes, definitely yes. Okay, a painful period it means a strong uterine contraction. Okay, and this uterine contraction sometimes can affect the the uterine function. Okay, why? Because a very painful period, a very strong uterine contraction can alter that the 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 the, the, the architecture of the uterus and can provoke adenomyosis and therefore can provoke a fibrosis. Okay, if uh, if there is adenomyosis or if there is a uterine fibrosis, this can provoke a fail, uh, an implantation failure and also can provoke miscarriage. Okay, so if there are several painful periods, okay, it's uh, just a one, a one painful period, so the, the uterine function doesn't, is not affected, but a chronic painful period can, be, can provoke a dysfunction of the uterus. And thank you so much for another explanation to this question as well. And next one is, is cure time better for a miscarriage than medical treatment? Okay, so there is no better treatment than another, okay? But uh, we have to take into account that um, the medical treatment of the, of, the, of, the, of the miscarriage okay, sometimes can provoke a strong uterine uterine contractions, okay, and this uterine contraction can provoke a severe uterine bleeding, okay, and this can provoke uh, uh, can damage the uterus, okay. Sometimes uh, when when the medical treatment is not enough, uh, a curative a, a DNC is required, okay, uh, and so there is no treatment better than another, okay, but uh, if there is strong uterine contraction, my, our, our advice is to perform a, a curative, but also the curative can damage the, the uterus, okay? So it's not better, not, not better treatment than, than another. But uh, we've seen that after, you know, clinic, after a, 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 a medical treatment of the uterus, the, 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 the uterus can be very damaged and, and can be, can be, can be, Diff can be after can, it can be difficult to to perform an embryo transfer in that uterus. So, so my advice would be to to do a DNC if if it's possible. If not, this this because if the, if the medical treatment has all his, it has his, its, its advantages because it's it's more natural and it's it, it can be at home, so it's more personal. Okay, but but it depends in, in each case. <laughs> Thank you so much. And of course, now we will go to the final question of those most common ones. And after that, it will be time for your questions. And of course, I do see you are sending your questions already. So uh, thank you already for that. And let's go to that final question, which is, what is the optimal endometrial thickness for an embryo transfer? Okay, so there is no real consensus on the endometrial uh, thickness. Okay, uh, in, in in normal conditions, we prefer uh, we, we we prefer an embryo an endometrial thickness from seven to 
14 millimeters, okay? But if in here, in our clinic, we prefer to, to, we prefer to have an endometrial thickness from seven millimeters to 10 millimeters, okay? But it's more important the, 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 the endometrial appearance than the thickness, okay? It's, the endometrial should be a triple layer, it should be trilaminar, and we don't have, we don't need to have any any polyps, any fibers, of course, and the endometrium that it doesn't have, mean it doesn't have to have a hyperperistaltis. It means that the strong contraction of the endometrium, okay, and it has not have to be any uh, any mucus inside the the, the endometrium. Okay, so if it, it depends also on the context of the patient. For example, if the, if the patient has endometrium, has uh, 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 the, the hair endometrium is very thick, but and it, it, it cannot do, it cannot uh, make a thin, a thin endometrium. We can go ahead, of course, it depends. But uh, we, in, in ideal conditions, it should be between seven and ten millimeters. Okay. As always, thank you so much for answering those five most common questions that we receive, of course. And now, as you know, it is time for your questions. And as I mentioned, there are plenty of those questions ready. So, well, I guess we can go ahead with those, right? Excellent. That's okay. Sorry, here's the first one. So, how likely is it for polyps to come back after a couple of months? Okay, so thank you, Alessia, for the question. Okay, so yes, the polyp is, it can be, it can, the, the problem of the polyps is that they, the recurrency, okay? So, uh, yes, it can, it can grow. If you will remove a polyp, uh, we can, it, after a couple of months, it can come back, okay? That sure will be another polyp, okay? So, so yes. Ideally, normally in the first two months, if we remove a polyp, uh, normally it cannot appear another one but after six months it can it can perfectly appear a new one if the patient is is likely to to have polyps because there are some patients that the endometrium are very very it provokes a lot of polyps this is because the structure of the endometrium is very glandular okay and they can it has a lot of estrogen and they can provoke polyps okay so if a patient that we have removed a polyp we have to we have to be uh, we have to check very deeply that she has uh, all the polyps after a couple of months. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much for your very first question. And of course, for your help, as always, with that one. Um, next question from the same patient. Okay, so what does constitute abnormal bleeding after period? I mean, is pain bleeding on day five or six normal? Okay, so it depends on, on your periods, okay? Uh, an abnormal bleeding in a, in a menstrual cycle is completely normal, okay? So we are not clocks. So it is sometimes a patient can have an, a, a cycle that is, is abnormal and she can bleed in, in mid-cycle or she can bleed, have a, a pink bleeding on day five, six. So from a point on bleed, it, it's completely normal. Of course, if every cycle is like that, you should, you should see a consultant and we can perform an ultrasound scan to check that everything is okay because sometimes uh, the, the bleeding and abnormal bleeding is caused by uterine fibroid, by adenomyosis, by uh, a poly, so it, it has to, we have to check. But if it's your first your abnormal uterine bleeding, probably it doesn't mean anything. And if in the next period, the period is, is abnormal, you have to, to consult to a specialist. Yeah. Understood. Once again, thank you so much for that explanation. Next question is also ready. So how could it be prevented during a multiple fiber surgery that scars that are built lead to infertility? Okay, so it depends if the if the if the the, the surgery is done by laparoscopy or by hysteroscopy. If we perf we perform a myomectomy during uh, hysteroscopy, okay, uh, to prevent the scar tissue because this is very common, we always have to 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 give uh, contraceptive pill, which is or estrogens, okay, to avoid the uterine adhesions. Okay, because when we perform a surgery, this scar, this, this tissue is very, very sensitive, and it can, it can, it, it can, 
it can be very sticky, okay? So we have to, to give estrogens or a, a contraceptive pill at least for a month, okay? Then in our clinic, we use also uh, hyaluronic acid, okay, to, to, to avoid uterine uh, adhesion or sinicae, or we can also introduce a balloon, which is which is a, a, a balloon inside the uterus to uh, avoid this 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 sinicae. Okay, it depends of the of the of the degree of surgery of the degree of some of the fibro. And if it's a laparoscopy, and the laparoscopy, as uh, if we don't we, we do not touch the endometrial cavity, we can we don't uh, use anything. We we give the contraceptive pills to avoid the uterine bleeding, uh, and that's all. Okay. And once again, thank you for another explanation. Next question also is interesting. So, is it possible that polyp recurrency can cause Asherman syndrome? It depends. Okay, it depends if it not on not, it's not the polyps per per se, but is if we remove the polyp. So, if we perform several hysteroscopy to do a, uh, to remove the polyp, of course, we can cause the Asherman syndrome. In fact, in the Asherman syndrome. Uh, is caused 90% 90, 90 uh, is diatogenic, I mean, it's caused by, uh, by, by surgeries or by miscarriage or by, because uh, it is, is uh, provoked by, uh, by the doctor, okay? Um, uh, for, to prevent the Ashman syndrome, it's important to remove, the, when we do a stereoscopy, to, to try to not to damage, uh, damage the endometrial cavity. How can we damage the endometrial cavity if we perform, if we use energy? Okay, if in our in here in our clinic we don't we never use bipolar bipolar scissors. Okay, we only we, we use scissors without energy because the energy provokes uh, it can it can burn the tissue. And if we burn the tissue, this this means a scar tissue, okay? It's a scar tissue, or even it can provoke uh, uh, an infection and an abuse, okay? So uh, it is better to only use uh, uh, we call a cold scissors, okay, to avoid the the, the Asherman syndrome. So yes, the the multiple surgery, the multiple hysteroscopy can provoke an Asherman syndrome if it's not performed by a reproductive surgeon. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much for this one as well. Um, okay, next question. Could scars that are outside the uterus be a problem during the pregnancy? Scars that are outside the uterus? You, uh, I don't know, but probably you, are, you mean that uh, scars that are outside the endometrial cavity, okay, and they are in the myometrium. Normally not, okay? So if we, you have removed, you have been removed a, a, a uterine fibro, uh, probably not because the, there is not there is no it cannot affect the, the develop, development of the pregnancy. Of course, after uh, after a, a surgery, after a, a, a surgery of fibroids, it's important to 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 let the the, the uterus and to to help the, to let the uterus heal okay and this is for we need at least four months okay it means that after after a laparoscopy after a surgery of the uterus it's important to to wait at least four months we are talking only if we are removing and uh, fibers which are not inside the endometrial cavity if it's inside the endometrial cavity we can only wait uh we we we, we can only wait one one or two months but it is outside the endometrial cavity, we need to wait at least four months to put an embryo back. So this is to avoid the, the uterine rupture during the pregnancy, because the, 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 the after, when there is a pregnancy, the uterus grows, okay, grows, grows, grows. The uterus is a muscle, so it, it has to work to, to, to grow. So if there is a, a, a scar, it can, the scar can, 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 broke and then we there is a, a big problem okay so at least it's it's worth to wait at least four months after a surgery of of, of the fiber okay. and again thank you so much for that um next question can could polyp scars cause problems with uterine lining yes but not only polyp scars okay you mean with scars uh, because scars for a fibroid, scars for a polyp, scars for a uterine septum. So yes, it can cause a, a problem of the uterine lining. It can provoke uh, a uterine adhesion. It can provoke sinicae. Okay, 
and also it can provoke that the, the, the endometrium doesn't grow, okay? Because sometimes we damage the, the we damage the, the lining, the, the 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 zone, the the where the endometrium needs to grow. So uh, the endometrium is like like the is it, are, it, it needs to grow thanks to the uh, to the stem cells that are behind the endometrial line. Okay? So if we damage this these these cells okay if we damage the the, the, endo, the junction zone which is called if we damage, damage this because of because of our of our curettage because of our hysteroscopy of course we can we can damage the uterine lining okay that's why it's very important to 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 understand what we are looking for when we are doing a, pre, uh, a hysteroscopy and also it's very important that this hysteroscopy and this surgery uh, has to be done by a, by, a, by a reproductive surgeon. And once again, thank you so much for this. Next question, a bit of a longer one. So I have five centimeter subserosal fibroid and isthmic area of the uterus. I was I had done uterine artery embolization that caused me premature menopause. It did nothing to the fibroid. What factors should I consider or has to examine considering uterus before trying pregnancy with donor X? Okay, yes. Uh, thank you, Anneli, for your question. Okay, so the problem with the with the the uterine embolization is that sometimes sometimes it, it, it doesn't it doesn't affect the fiber. Okay, so uh, and some and it can affect the the, the ovaries and can provoke a premature menopause because it can also it can kill the 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 ovary is gonna be toxic. Okay, so yes, if you have a premature menopause, you have you probably should you should go to a to a donor X. Okay, of course it, it depends. If we, if I, I don't see you personally, if I don't scan you, uh, I don't know. I mean, it depends on your age. If we see that you you have follicles, of course we can try without a donor X. But 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 if you have an established menopause, we have to go ahead with a, with a donor X. And regarding the fibroid, it, it depends. If it's if it's in the isthmic area and it's not reaching the endometrial cavity, we can try. As we are going ahead with the donor eggs, probably your your embryos will be will be in a very 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 good quality. Okay, so we can try to put embryo back, depending also on the location of the of the of the of the fibroid. Okay, but we can try to put an embryo back. If you don't got pregnant, okay, my advice will be okay. Let's remove the fibroid because there is something there that it's 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 decreasing the the, the implantation rate, okay. But if, at least in the isthmic area, uh, it it can also affect the embryo transfer, okay, because the isthmic area is very close to the to the cervix, okay. And sometimes when there is a fibroid there, the it can it can be it can difficult the the embryo transfer so is there you no know, pro is there is no problem with the embryo transfer and the the fibroid is not reaching the endometrial cavity and we can see perfectly in the 3d ultrasound scan that the endometrium is completely clear we can go ahead it depends also in your case probably i will ask for an mri to to check that everything is fine before putting embryos back and again, thank you so much for your question and your advice, your recommendations to this as well. Um, okay, next one. Uh, of course, I have already sent you the link. You will be able to rewatch those five minutes of the session, so don't worry. And the question is, are there treatment options for diffuse adenomyosis with a thick junctional zone over 30 millimeters with the chance of maintaining fertility potential? Okay, yes, so in the treatment of the adenomyosis, we, we have two, two options, okay? We have two, two, the medical treatment and the surgical treatment, okay? Uh, or both, of course. The, the medical treatment consists in, in decreased estrogens, okay? The adenomyosis is, is estrogen dependent, okay? So uh, if, we, if we, we try to decrease estrogens, the adenomyosis will be, will be controlled. Okay, so the medical treatment would be the the, the the analogs, okay, the GnRH analogs, okay, which is the capeptide or gonapeptide, okay. So depend it depends on your use of the, of the because the diffuse adenomyosis, it is better to use a medical treatment. 
pill and then focal adenomyosis, sometimes it's better to use the surgery to remove this focal adenomyosis, which is the adenom adenomectomy, okay? The problem with the, the surgical treatment is that the adenomyosis is not like a fiber, okay? A focal adenomyosis, this adenomyosis is very vascularized, it's, it's very vascularized, vascularized, so sometimes it, the surgery is very difficult because you cannot touch, it's all, you can you touch all the tissue, it's not like a fiber that is surgery is very very easy because it's like it's like a ball introduced there inside the myometrium. The adenomyosis is it's very it's very very difficult, and sometimes we have to remove a, a, a completely block of the uterus to remove all the adenomyosis. So sometimes it's, it's better to do a medical treatment of the of the adenomyosis to reduce the size of the of the adenomyosis, and then if there is, uh, there is still adenomyosis to perform an, uh, the surgery, okay? And sometimes the adenomyos adenomyomas is located very close to the endometrial lining, we can, we can remove them by stereoscopy, okay? But yeah, uh, the, the treatment, the medical treatment of the adenomyosis is, is, is easy, okay? It is well tolerated. Is in consists to decrease the estrogen there with the decapeptide. Also, we can use all of all the drugs uh, uh, like aromatase inhibitors or the OCP. Okay, but uh, estrogen uh, progesterone. progesterone. Uh, this is used. Uh, it's very common to use progesterone even in case of uh, painful periods caused by adenomyosis, and also to decrease the volume of the of the uterus. And it is not work. It doesn't work. There we can. We need to go ahead with the the, the, the surgery. Excellent. Thank you so much once more for a thorough explanation to this one. Um, next question, of course, is also ready. If you decide to carry on with transfer, but there's a small polyp of one centimeter, is it more likely to fail? Okay. So if we are, for example, in, in my case, if I, I we are in a uterine preparation. For an embryo transfer, and then I see that there is a polyp. Okay, I will cancel. I mean, because we don't know. This has not been demonstrated that if there is a polyp, the the, the, the the result would be a zero. We don't know. Okay, but it has been demonstrated that the polyp can can and it might decrease the implantation rate. So if we have a lot of embryos, okay, we can we can we can try. Okay, but if because here uh, our patient they have very low ovarian reserve and then every single embryo are very, 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 very important. Okay, so I will cancel. I will not go ahead, but it depends on your case. Okay, it means that if there is a polyp, your, your, your pregnancy will be, will be negative. I don't know, I'm not sure. But if there, there is a negative uh, test, what 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 has caused that? When can, is the is the cause of because of the uterine polyp? Is because of the embryo? Is because of the of, of the uterus? We don't know. So if there is a potential a potential thing that can decrease the the the, the, the implantation, of course I, I will go ahead and I will trick and I will do a stereoscopy to remove this small polyp. All right, excellent. Thank you so much. Once more. Okay, next question is: So, how long after fibro surgery should one uh, start uh, stimulation for egg banking? No transfer. Yeah, if there is no transfer, you can go ahead, and, and on, on the next period, there is no, there is no problem with that. Okay, as we are not transferring, the uterus will, will it won't grow, so we can go ahead in the next period, or even uh, next month, or even two months. There is no. We cannot, we cannot wait for months. So yeah. And thanks a million for this one as well. Okay, next question is: Would you recommend that a 14 centimeters, 12 centimeters subserosal fiber to be removed before becoming a donor egg IVF recipient? Yes. Okay, so depends. It is a complete subserosal. It means that there is only. It, it, there is no intramuscular uh, component. Okay, we can go ahead. It's very very big, and probably during the pregnancy you will have you will have uh, pain because of compression of the fibroid because it's very big. And during a pregnancy, sometimes the the, the fibroid can grow. Okay, and if you will have 
the, 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 your womb very big and then the fibroid, you will feel very, 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 very bad. Okay. And also this fiber can come, can, can, can provoke uterine contraction. But if it's a complete subserosal fibroid, it depends. It depends on the scan and also it depends on how many embryos do we have. Okay. If it's an egg, if you would be an egg, an egg recipient, probably you will have very good quality areas so we can try okay but for you because it fits is very very big probably and the surgery of an intra of a, a subsurface of fibroid is very very easy there is no complications okay because it's very easy to remove it probably i will go ahead with the removal okay because it's very very big wonderful thank you so much for that one um next question is the endometrial hyperplasia a big issue for embryo implantation? How does it affect this the condition? Uh, sorry, this condition, the pregnancy. What treatment do you recommend to cure the endometrial hyperplasia? Okay, so if you have an hyperplasia, endometrial hyperplasia, of course, my, my recommendation would be you just don't go ahead with 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 the embryo transfer because the hyperplasia is the first step of uh, uh, the hypoplasia after some time if we if we don't treat the hypoplasia it can become a malign malign hyperplasia and can become an endometrial cancer okay? I, I don't want to to scare you okay but the hyperplasia means that there is a lot of estrogens okay in in your endometrial and the more estrogen that we do have the bigger endometrial you you make okay? so we have to with this hyperplasia the treatment is to give you progesterone Okay, but of course we need to check that everything is fine. So probably we will do a biopsy of the of the of the endometrium. If it's a simple hyperplasia, okay, there is no no issues. But we need to prepare your uterus with with low doses of estrogen because with your estrogens, with your own estrogen, you 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 make uh, endometriums very very thick. So in your case, probably. It, 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 we should prepare your uterus with low doses. And it does not affect this condition to the pregnancy. It doesn't affect, okay? If it's a simple, simple hyperplasia, it means that everything is fine, but hey, there is an alarm, okay? So it means that your uterus needs progesterone, okay? After the pregnancy, my advice would be, okay, just uh, just introduce an IUD, okay? Uh, and you're trying to be dispositive uh, to, to to, to to avoid this hyperplasia, okay? All right. Thank you so much again for the uh, for the question as well as your recommendations to that. And as you can see, there are a few questions left. So uh, let me go straight to the next one. How fast do fibers grow back after fiber surgery? What can be done to prevent it to grow back? Okay, so it depends. Okay, it depends on each patient. Each patient. Sometimes you will remove this fibro and you will never have another one. And sometimes after a year, you can have another one. It's not. Uh, it's not. The recurrence is not as as big as the the polyps. Okay, but but yeah, it can. As if the patient has still her periods. Okay, because the fibers are also estrogen dependent. Okay, it means that uh, when the when the person has Periods and have this she is fertile, uh, the, the fibers can be can come back. Okay, so that's why it's it's better if she has fibers to 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 prevent it. It's better to give her, her uh, the contraceptive pill. Okay, to make things stable. Uh, okay, the contraceptive pills such as oral pills or the or the the, the vaginal ring or the you trying to be in this positive. Okay, so to so make things to be to have a standby things uh, to make low estrogens and low progesterone. Okay, so if you have fibers and you have removed it, uh, my advice would be just to take the, the, the OCP, the contraceptive pill. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you so much. And actually, there is a follow up, okay, from the very same uh, patient. So, let me go straight to this one. So, could fiber grow fast during or after many stimulations for IVF? If yes, when does it depend on the estrogen level during stimulation? Yes, so as I told you before, the fibers are estrogen dependent, okay. So, and uh, the more estrogen that we have, the more probability of, of, of growing. That's why during the, the pregnancy, this the, the, the fibers can grow. 
Okay, so if our estrogen is very, very low, which happens with when we are taking the, the, the oral pills or, or the, the, the IV, uh, this can maintain very stable the, 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 the fiber. Okay, so yes, it can grow fast, fast after the stimulations. That's, that's the thing, because when we are during the, the stimulation, your, your estrogen your levels uh, will increase, and this can provoke the, the, uh, an increase of the size of the, of the fiber. Okay? But of course, if you have a fiber measuring two centimeters after a stimulation, I don't expect to have a fiber measuring five centimeters. It can grow, but just a little bit, and, and the fibers normally grow slowly, very, very slowly. If there is a very, very big, uh, grow after uh, when we grow after a stimulation, uh, you can you need to see especially because it, it can it can be a, 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 it can be a malign fibro. Okay, so so you have to control that. All right. Again, thank you so much for explaining this once more as well. Um, okay, sorry, just checking. Yes, of course, there is another question right here. So, how common is silent endometriosis where there is not other factors other than advanced age, 39, 42? Would you suggest laparoscopy to explore if, if there is endometriosis? Okay, so, no. Okay, if there is no no... If there is no indication for the laparoscopy, I mean, if there is no pain, uh, I won't. I won't suggest a laparoscopy just to explore. Okay, if there is, for example, if there is no endometriomas, big endometriomas, if there is no pain, I mean, if there is no that is minorrhea, or if there is no no pain when you are when you are in the toilet or when you are uh, when you are having having sex. Okay, there is no my advice just no no you no. Okay, because the laparoscopy is a surgery, it has its, compl his, its complications, so I, I won't suggest that. We have several tools to diagnose a lapar uh, an endometriosis, such as the MRI, such as the, the scan, okay, uh, a, high, a high, high level scan, okay, so just to explore if there is an indication of surgery, like, such as an hydrosalpine, a fibro, everything, of course we can just go to try to find a uh, silent endometriosis, but my recommended use for that will be, will be, will be the case. All right, again, thank you so much for your question again, and of course your help. And next question is also from Karen. What is the connection between endometrium lining and periods? I had a normal thickness of the endometrium lining, but very light periods lasting only two days, which seems too short and possibly a problem. It's not a problem. Probably your uterus is small, okay? Uh, normally, if the endometrium lining is very, very big, I mean, it's very thick, uh, sometimes the the the, the periods are strong and are heavy, okay. But it's it's, it's not always like that, okay. Uh, it's not the endometrial lining, but it's also the, the volume of the endometrial cavity. So probably in a three D ultrasound scan, if you have short periods, okay, uh, you probably will see we we can see that the endometrial cavity is too small, okay. And the smaller the uterine cavity, the shorter periods, okay. So it's not the uterine lining. Because, for example, when you are taking the contraceptive pill, your uterine lining is very, very, very thin, and you still have periods when you stop the, the contraceptive pill. So it's not just because of that; it also depends on your hormone levels and also of the uterine of your contractility. Okay. And don't worry, it can be as long if there is, if your uterine cavity has the correct volume, it cannot be; it should not be a problem. Mm -hmm. And excellent. Thank you. And there was a thing from Karen. That is very helpful. <laughs> and well, next question is also ready. So is a four month wait required for diagnostic laparoscopy or only for treatment? What is the risk of diagnostic laparoscopy in causing damage or scar tissue? Okay. So if it's a diagnosis laparoscopy, as it's safe, it's only for diagnosis. This is not a, a surgery. Okay. If it is only just two open and see, okay, there is no risk, there is no risk of scar tissue, okay, but uh, if you use a dinosaur laparoscopy, this can cause also, uh, it can cause 
uh, additions can cause additions outside the, the the uterus, and this can provoke pain. Okay, because uh, because when we introduce when we introduce the, the optic the optic to perform the laparoscopy, this the the, 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 the tissue okay, the tissue reacts and can perform scars. And these scars, if they are very very big, also because the patient has this type of skin, okay, and tissues, uh, they can provoke scars and also it can affect the, the fallopian tubes and can affect the pelvic the pelvic floor, okay, and it can provoke pain. But uh, normally with only a diagnosed laparoscopy there is no there is no any problem if we perform a surgery for it there which is a lot of time operating with uh, with uh, with blood with uh, in, in the, if there is an infection with a hydrosalpins it can we can provoke uh, scars okay but not for a diagnosed laparoscopy i have not seen that never And again, thank you so much for that. And another thank you from the patient for you right here. Um, sorry, next question is also ready. Just give me a second. Okay. How does this history of bacterial vaginogenesis, sorry, affect fertility? I have had antibiotics after a microbiota test is my next round of IVF likely to be more successful. Okay. Yes. So, uh... It's, it has been demonstrated that yes, the vaginosis, which is a disbalance of, uh, of the endometrial of the endometrial microbiome. Okay, we have to take into account that the the vagina has its, its own uh, microbiome and the endometrium has its own microbiome. Okay, contrary to that, we we, we thought the endometrium has its own microbiome, it's not sterile. Okay, so it has been demonstrated that after a, 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 a control ovarian stimulation, the bacteria, the the the, the good bacteria that protects the, our vagina can, can be altered and uh, can provoke a disbalance of the endometrial floor, of the endometrial microbiome, and can lead to the bad pathogens to, uh, to colonize the vagina, okay? This bad pathogen can provoke an implantation failure, okay? So, uh, yes, if uh, you have a is bacterial vaginosis, it can affect the fertility, it can affect the implantation, and can also provoke uh, miscarriage. So, if you have been diagnosed with vaginosis, this vaginosis should be treated. Okay, that's why they they, they gave you uh, antibiotics. Okay, uh, and it's very very important to treat to to take probiotics in that case. Okay, prior prior to the endometrial to the stimulation, and then after. Uh, for the embryo transfer to assure that your microbiome is completely fine. All right, again, thank you so much for that advice. All right, next one is a surgery done by an expert should not damage the uterine lining, right? Could it anyway happen? Of course, it, there is always, it uh, can always happen some complication, but it is do, done by an expert. I mean, this expert knows that it has to, it has to, to, to maintain the, the, the fertility of the patient. Okay. So, uh, it's, it's not, it's unlikely to happen. Okay. But, but also if there is a complicated surgery or your, your, you 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 can you do because of because of your your skin or because your tissue uh, heals not yeah, the healing process is not very good you can you can form uterine adhesions but if it's done by uterine by a step surgeon it's very unlikely okay but it depends on the grade of surgery depends on where the 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 fibers are located so so it depends it's not it's also it is very important the surgeon but also it's very important the characteristics of the patient and also the characteristics of, of the fibroid polyp or or CDKI. all right once again thank you for the explanation and are polyps fibers and adhesions within the uterine always visible on scans well, sometimes, okay. If it's a, a, a and also it depends on, on, on the on the on the on the cycle of the patient. It depends on the moment when we are performing the scan. If, if the scan is performed during the the, the 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 period or during the follicular phase, it's very unlikely, okay. 
the more you the the, the, the more thick the thicker is the endometrium the uh, it's easier to check these the fibers and the poly okay the fibers if it's very fiber a big fiber we can always see okay if it's, if it's done by by uh, gynecologist okay and the poly sometimes is a bit if it's a very big polyp it's we can see okay the polyps that are less than one centimeter sometimes it's difficult and we need a thicker a thick endometrium just to check we also have some tools to, uh, that we can use in the ultrasound scan that uh, there are sometimes the polyps have they have a vessel okay uh, which is called the 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 it's the, the vessel that is feeding we can see the feeding vessel we call it's feeding the the polyp okay and sometimes we can see an image of a of a vessel that is is, is in the center of the polyp and this can help for the diagnosis okay but sometimes it's difficult to see polyp because sometimes we we there is no polyps and this image can be just the the, the endometrium that image uh, can can also has the image of poly polyps okay and and it's difficult and the and if we are we we, we are not sure the best method to diagnose the, the polys and fibers is to do a diagnosis seroscope which is only to introduce the optic the, the optic and then just see if there is if there is something inside the endometrial cavity all right thank you once again for that explanation um next question there will be like three parts of it of course so let me just read them all and i will be showing you one by one okay so the first one is i have two small fibers 1.5 and 2 centimeters intramural and usually my endometrium gets to seven eight millimeters after evaluation ovulation naturally to avoid overexposure to estrogens we suggest a natural cycle without medication to thicken the lining of the uterus and i will have a polyp removed in a few days and i will be close to my period maybe three four days before it is that an issue i don't want to postpone it due to COVID. i want to transfer in january donor x can the polyp grow back in the meantime and sorry not this one this is the follow-up do you suggest i remove the fibers all the doctors said no for now but i'm not sure and this is the beginning okay so First part, your fibers, uh, they are, it's, it's true, it's true that they are small, okay, but it depends, I don't know that, I don't know where they are located, okay, so it depends. If they are located, uh, if they reach the endometrial cavity, of course, they will have to remove it, even if there is only 1.5 centimeters, okay, or even if there is in the fundus, okay. The fundal part of the uterus is the most important one, or is the most important for the pregnancy, okay, so it is located there, uh, it depends. Uh, we, uh, I would like to see the images, okay? So I, I cannot tell you if you have to remove that. It depends on the, of the location and it depends of, of the relation uh, to the endometrial cavity, okay? Your endometrial looks well, uh, I mean, uh, seven, eight millimeters after the ovulation are okay, okay? But it is better to check prior to the, to the ovulation, okay? And uh, to do a natural cycle, okay, yes, why not? Here in our clinic, we do a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of natural cycles. Okay? If we see that you're in, in the mitral lining, uh, uterine lining, and it has the correct shape and the correct uh, thickness, okay, why not? Perfect. And can, can I see the, the, the follow-up question, please? Yes, of course. Just give me a second, and here's the second part of it. Yes. So uh, ideally, the, the the polyps are removed uh, after in the in the first part of the of the of the cycle. Okay, the, in the follicular phase. In the follicular phase. Why? Because that is what the endometrium will be will be uh, thin. Okay, and for this surgeon will be easy because if there is a remove and um, prior to the to the period. Okay, sometimes your endometrium is very big and for the surgeon it will be difficult to catch the polyp. Okay, so it's better if you're taking the contraceptive pill, okay, or if you are you, uh, after, after the period, for example, on day seven, between day seven and day eight of the period. Okay, so it is better. And I don't think that in two months you will have another polyp. It, it is possible, of course, so that's why you probably you, you have to you have to check. But I don't think that you will have a big polyp in, in two months. It will be very unfortunate. 
unfortunate. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Once, as you can one see, one on the back and one on the front. Here, in, one on the front it depends. If it's close to the to the endometrium, to the endometrial cavity, and if you have, if it's your first embryo transfer, of course, I will say, okay, just go ahead. If you have a a, 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 comp, a, a you have a, a, all the treatments uh, and your history of infertility is very, 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 very long. I will say just remove it. If it's your first embryo transfer, I will tell you, okay, just just try it because probably there is no issues with the with this fiber. Yeah. All right. Okay. Sorry, there are some comments or so not close. So they say I never try first embryo transfer. Okay. So if it's your first embryo transfer, don't worry. I think it will be fine. Just don't worry. Be happy. Just get this poly <laughs> removed and you will get pregnant. Wonderful. And of course, thank you from the patient for you as well. All right. Thank you so much for those. And actually, now it seems that this will be our final question. Uh, so let's get to this straight away. So is that any prevention that can be done to avoid polyps recurrence? Yes. So if there is... It depends also on the patient, the characteristics of the patient and the, the, the characteristics of the endometrium, or this its own endometrium. So if for example you 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 have you had a polyp removed and then you are waiting for another embryo transfer or you are waiting for another cycle, my advice would be to 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 use the contraceptive pill, okay, to use uh, to avoid the estrogen exposure, okay, to avoid a lot of Pain, uh, painful periods, or to avoid a lot of uh, a lot of estrogen uh, dysregulation. Okay, so so yes, my advice will be just to make the line very, 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 very thin. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. And one more question has just was sent to us. So let's have a look. How long does high estrogen levels stay in the body after the egg retrieval? Does it drop right out right away? It's, it's, it doesn't drop uh, right away. Okay, at least for it depends of uh, of the trigger. Okay, if you have been triggered with ovitrel, this drop is is sl slowly. Okay, after, uh, and then after, uh, it's it drops until the period comes. Okay, after the decapeptidin um, trigger is it drops after five days. Okay, we have also we have also some tools to to make the drop uh, uh, faster. Okay, because for example, when we are stimulating a patient that has uh, cancer, that has a, a, a breast cancer, and then with with the breast cancer, the estrogen that they eat, they, it doesn't have to be very 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 high because we can we can we can damage the patient. Okay, so after the the, the egg retrieval, the patient takes uh, aromatizing neuter takes a pill that can drop the estrogen level. Okay, but if the, if the patient doesn't have any 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 medical background, that it doesn't the, the high estrogens uh, doesn't damage the doesn't damage the body okay so you have you don't have to to, to worry about that after five then after five to five, 14 days the, the period will come and then the estrogen will be completely completely fine okay but yeah normally after after the capital injection five days and the obituary injection will be 10 to 14 days all right okay thank you so much and sorry um yeah there was a thank you from oh sorry um i guess just it's making right. sure it's Bye the right. right one yes perfect okay sorry um next question actually okay in the meantime we do have received one more so my endometrial lining on day nine of treatment was 10 uh, 76 it was growing roughly two per day between day three and nine for the seven days between then and transfer do you think this would likely grow at the same rate so maybe uh, sorry i'll carry my inventory on day nine of the treatment was it was growing roughly two per between day three and nine for the seven days between them and transfer do you think 
Okay, it depends. It depends. So yes, if if you are in the medium and the at the beginning is very is thick, okay. Of course, after the intro, after the, the the introduction of the progesterone, normally uh, the 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 endometrium it, it compacts, okay, which is the the function of the of the progesterone. Okay, but sometimes this endometrium because it has a lot of estrogen, it can grow a lot, and this is not good for an embryo transfer. Okay, so that's why sometimes if we we are facing a, a, a thick endometrium, sometimes we prefer to see the patient the day of the the day before or the same day of the embryo transfer, just to confirm that the endometrium is okay, and then. We, we perform the transfer, okay? So yes, it can grow fast, it can grow fast, but it, is, it, it, it doesn't normally happen, okay? Normally with the progesterone, the endometrium is compacted. So sometimes when we are the, the endometrium that measure uh, 12 millimeters and then uh, we store the progesterone and the day of the endotransfer, this, this, this endometrium is between nine and 12, which is completely fine. It means that it, it, the endometrium has compacted, is it, 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 white, okay, which is the function of the, of, the, of the progesterone. Okay, so don't worry, don't worry about that. If your endometrium is the 14, 15 millimeters, that I would say that is not a very good endometrium for endometrium. But in that case, in your case, I will go ahead with endometrium without any problem. All right, again, thank you so much. And sorry, there are two more questions and we will be finishing, okay? And remember that you will have a chance to get in touch with Dr. Alejandra and her team. There is a link I will send you in a second where you will be able to do it if you would like to get some more details. But right now, let's have a look as we have a follow-up, okay? So is it normal to get the period six days after retrieval when using the capital? No transfer. Yeah, it's completely normal. The decapitide, the, it, it provokes a, an early period, okay? The decapitide provokes a very fast drop of the hormones, okay? So that's why the period comes normally between day five and six after the equation. So yes, it's completely it's completely normal. If it was with a, with a ovitrail, your period probably will appear 14 days, 14, 15 days after the, the collection, okay? And also if it's a dual trigger, it means that if it's with the capital and omitrail, it will be after five days, more or less. Okay, so yes, completely normal. All right, thank you for that. And one more that, as I mentioned, how thick is to take for the endometrium? From our point of view, okay, we, uh, it could be more than 14 millimeters or more than between 12 and 14 millimeters would be a, a thick endometrium. Okay. Less than less than 13 millimeters would be completely fine. Okay. So I prefer to have an endometrium 7.5, 8, 8.5, that 12.5, for, for example. Okay. Even in, in, in the clinical, in the clinical guides and, and, and in, it has been demonstrated that this is a good endometrium, but from my experience, I prefer, I have better results with endometriosis measuring with 7 and 10 millimeters than with 10 and 14 millimeters. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. And that was our final question. So, well, definitely there are lots and lots of comments. So I just want you to see them. Thank you so much for all the answers. Thank you. Thank you for an informative session. And of course, excellent. I have learned a lot. It was a very good session. Thanks for your patience and all your answers. And of course, much, uh, a lot and lots more. So yes, I, of course, definitely agree. As always, Dr. Alejandra, you've been brilliant with answering all those tech questions. And of course, um, I can only say that thank you so much, everyone, for joining and for your very interesting, very uh, various, uh, on various topics, of course, also questions. So uh, we definitely appreciate that. And I definitely think it has been useful for you. And I am very happy that uh, you did learn a lot as well from this webinar and well dr alhandra as always great pleasure to have you back i know that it's quite late for you so i do hope you will have a restful 
evening as well. And to everyone else, of course, thank you so much once more for joining. Remember, it has been recorded. So, of course, you will have a chance to re-watch this on our site. And, well, um, Dr. Handa, anything else you would like to add? Thank you. As always, it's a pleasure for me. Okay, so uh, if there is also questions that you have, would you want me to answer? Of course, I will be more than happy to answer them by email. So please do not hesitate. Just answer. Okay, and I will be happy to join us to join you soon. All right, excellent. Thank you so much. And of course, remember that uploaded on our YouTube channel channel sorry tomorrow and on our IVFNs my IVFNs.com website so don't miss the chance to simply subscribe that way you will know when the new video is uploaded and of course all the past events also from Dr. Alejandra are available on our website so you can go ahead and visit it that way you will be able to see some other topics from Dr. Alejandra as well and I can only um, invite you for tomorrow there is another topic another expert so hope you will be able to join us at 8 p.m uk time as always and of course thank you so much have a pleasant evening and uh, Dr. Alejandra I know already till our next session of course as well right thank you very much good night and thank you very much Caroline okay Excellent. Thank you. Take okay. care. You too. Bye-bye. Good night.